Okay, so good morning again. This is part two of week six of our Zoom leadership. And I am um, happy to announce that all of our inspections were approved. So sorry I had to jump off yesterday. It actually kind of worked out, I think, because there was no way I was going to finish what I had to say in, in another five minutes yesterday. So this is actually good to divide it up into two segments, um, a little, a little, um, so it's not as tedious to watch like a, an hour of, um, of me talking. Um, so yesterday, part one, I really just continued on talking about some sponsorship tips. I loved already some of the takeaways and the things. It's always so interesting to me and important for me to see what jumps out at you um, from a particular training. So then when I do it again, you know, like in the next eight weeks with the next group, I can kind of hone it to be more focused on the things that seem to really um, touch you guys and impact you guys. Um, Something that I'm seeing a lot of is that idea of giving equal time to sponsoring. And I think that that's probably huge. And it's certainly something that I didn't do at the beginning. You know, you look at your booking, selling, sponsoring, continuing education. And I feel like most people booking, selling, and continuing education are like the main activities. And then sponsoring, because it's our frog or because it seems like the hardest thing to do or, or whatever, um, almost becomes like the lowest on the totem pole when really if we could shift and make it the most important thing and certainly something that we put focus on every single day um, we would see growth and and changes in our businesses um, you know I said yesterday what you focus on is where you will see results and so if you're focusing on booking you will book parties if you're focusing on sales you will sell if you're focusing on sponsorship you will sponsor um, and it just kind of um, was cool to see that that some that a lot of you said that was a big light bulb like ooh I need to probably focus more of my time on sponsorship. Um, we talked about um, talking to people and hearing objections. That was another big one. It was a big one for me, so I knew it would be a big one for you guys. Um, but then where we where we left off and where I wanted to start off today was. Um, helping somebody get a strong start like once they've actually said yes once they've joined with you and you have actually sponsored somebody then taking those steps to making sure that they um feel successful and 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 achieve what they want to achieve with their business um now the the, the big understanding that everybody needs to have is of course um, yes, not selfish to share the opportunity. Absolutely, Denise. It's huge. You know, yeah, it's a gift that you've been given. So why would you not share that with other people? There's nothing pushy or, or uncomfortable about that. Um, and just thinking about if you had never heard about it, if somebody hadn't shared it with you, um, how sad that would make you. So you don't want to make other people sad. Um, but but the, the understanding that I really want to drive home throughout this whole eight weeks with you guys as leaders is that understanding of um, Trades of Hope as a direct selling business, that we are different within the industry because we have something different to offer. We have a different level of um, partnership with our artisans. and um, But at the end of the day, we're not immune from the numbers and the industry standard in terms of it's easy to join a direct selling company and it's also easy to to walk away and that half the people that you sponsor this month will be gone in four months and four out of or three months and four out of five of them will be gone within a year and so if you haven't sponsored somebody in in six months then your team might be completely gone you know or if you haven't sponsored somebody in a year you may not have a team anymore there is no um, real stability to this business other than you bringing a constant flow of new people to your team. And that is not um, meant to scare you or upset you, it just is. And once you kind of own that and realize that you're the, you're the sustainable piece, you're the stable piece, you're the, um, the thing that you can count on is you, um, then run with that. That should be almost comforting because I think so many women I've seen over the years get so bogged down by women that join but then don't actually do anything with their business. And it's like almost more devastating because of, because of our mission and because of the artisans and because we think that there's going to be some higher level of commitment when people come in. 
But the, the honest to goodness truth is that it, there's not, there's no guarantee that somebody just because we're trades of hope is going to have more commitment level and more success. Um, because, because of our artisans and because of our mission, um, we're still part of the direct selling industry, which we're not immune to that, to those numbers. Um, so yeah, I know it's, it's been comforting for me, Denise, to learn these things too. It's kind of like, Oh, all right. My, my team is normal. <laughs> the fact that half my team has disappeared since, you know, it's actually normal. It's nothing that I did. And that's the other piece of it too. It's nothing that you do wrong or right. We are all adults. You're not, uh, you know, we're not elementary school teachers that we're, there's some responsibility for the, the women that join our team are not, you know, five-year-olds. They're all grown women. Everybody has total control and responsibility for themselves. And you are a resource to them, a support to them. And they're, and then, and that's what I'm going to share is some things that I've learned um, to, to actually be a little bit better in that role. Um, but at the end of the day, you can lead a horse to water and if they don't drink it, it's, it has nothing to do with you. So you can also release yourself of that burden. Um, so I was, I left off yesterday talking about, um, Tracy Warren and how she, when she joined in January, um, it happened to be at the same time I was recommitting to the Pakistan unlock for freedom challenge that Holly had like redone in January. So it was sort of a God thing, I think, that, that Tracy joined in that month, right when I was wanting to, or I was not happy with my results, my inability to get five women to be qualified in the first Unlock Her Freedom Challenge. I was like, you know, if I'm really a leader in this company, if I'm really somebody who, you know, gets up on stage and wins awards, I should be able to do this. And when only three women in the entire company did it, I was like, okay, I've got to change there's something that's not, that I'm not doing um, well. And I wanted to change that. So Tracy came along and um, just at that right moment, and she had a lot of experience from, from another direct sales company. And um, one of the things that she said to me at the beginning of her journey was how great our, um, our onboarding, she used that, that, we don't use that word, but basically like bringing new people on, how great our onboarding program was. And I'm like, ooh, we have an onboarding program? What, is, what, is, what do you mean? <laughs> and she's like, well, it's just so simple. You know, you, knew, you encourage somebody to have a launch party, you know, to look at this, get to know the Smart Start and use that as a guide and to download the app. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty much all you need to do, isn't it, at the beginning? And I started to think about all of the things that I overloaded people with when they first started um, as new compassionate entrepreneurs I would send out you know you some of you have your sponsor you know I don't know Ryan and Colleen I don't know what I did to you guys but I probably sent you 10 emails with 45 links and you know drop boxes and YouTubes and who knows what and thankfully you're still here but um, I realized after Tracy said that that I could probably just simplify it to make sure they've got a launch party make sure they've downloaded the app and make sure that they're connected with the smart start. And so that's what I started to do in January with new compassionate entrepreneurs. I made sure that I had um, like a welcome interview conversation with them, something really simple, nothing, you know, I, I didn't set a lot of goals. I didn't, I didn't want to um, overwhelm them, but I did want to find out why they were a part of trades of hope. I think it's really important to understand what makes somebody um, connected to, to Trades of Hope. That's why I changed the legacy event post. The first post is, is really not a, about me as much as asking people, what interested you about Trades of Hope? Basically, why are you there? Why are you here at this event tonight? So I think it's important to start off with understanding why. And it doesn't take long to determine why somebody wanted to be a part of Trades of Hope. Um, you know, figuring out what they are excited about, and then talking about their launch, making sure they've had, got access to the app, and, and talking about the smart start. Um, you know, this poster is incredibly powerful for a brand new CE. And, and what Tracy's been doing, and I, I think it's really cool too, is she's been encouraging them to go ahead and fill in all the, the host and date boxes, even if they're not actually booked. With, with people that they think might want to do parties in those months. Um, you know, but, but using that smart start and making sure that they're familiar with it, is, that's really as far as you need to go. 
So a launch, the app, and a smart start. And that's basically what I've done with every brand new compassionate entrepreneur that joined with me starting in January. Because I really wanted to hit that Pakistan goal. I wanted to have more women become qualified. I wanted to be a better leader. You know, you probably noticed Trades of Hope has changed. We don't recognize the top sponsor anymore. We recognize the top leader. So it's not as much about how many people you bring on. It's about how many people you bring on and, and they become qualified. And that's where I wanted to be better. Um, because I've been top sponsor before, but I hadn't been top leader. And I was like, hmm, I want to do that. Um, and so that's what I did. Um, some other key things to do or not do with new people. Um, don't rush into training. This is a mistake, again, that I made early on, overwhelming people. The app has become a really wonderful tool for us as sponsors. Because if they're not willing to sit and watch a two-minute video, and then spin a prize wheel, like I don't know what else I can do with that. Like I'm not even asking them to watch a 15 minute video. I'm asking them to just go through the app, work through those tasks. Um, and, and so just let them work through the app. Don't worry about other trainings. Don't even, don't, don't give them more than they need at the point where they're at in their business. And that's been a huge lesson for me. You've got to make sure that they have an exciting goal. Um, the smart start is an important thing to use as a, just like we're using the compensation plan as a strategy for achieving our goal. The smart start cannot be their only goal because that's why when the smart start ends, people don't have anything that they're shooting for anymore. There's got to be something that's personal to them. Um, you know, in, preferably something, um, Denise, they can access all the same videos um, from in, in the back office, the, all the same videos that are on the app are in the back office and they're also um, on YouTube. You can find, there's an unlisted playlist, but you can access it and then send them to that. So if you go, if you go into one of the YouTube videos in the app and it pulls it up on YouTube, all of the videos for the entire app are listed there. So you can share that with somebody too. So little little hidden trick um, but you've got to make sure in that little welcome interview that you determine something that they that makes their heart beat faster just like we talked about you know you've got to have a goal that kind of thrills you it should have no more than a 12 month timeline for a brand new CE I would even suggest more of a six month timeline um, because you don't want you know again it's more of just a like a like a mental thing like you want to make sure that they're they're feeling that sense of urgency, immediacy, um, achievability. Um, so, so figure out what it is that's exciting. Right now, you know, thinking about buying something special for their spouse or for their kids for Christmas. Maybe they want to go on a ski trip. Maybe they, maybe she has some debt she wants to get out of before the end of the year. Um, you know anything you know this but something that's personal and and about her and you know now because you've gone through that training and you you learned about how to discover that within yourself you can help somebody else discover that but it's got to be something beyond the smart start that's exciting for her and that's going to help her when she starts to hit her first roadblocks because she's going to hit roadblocks, like you know. Um, Mary Christensen says, the fastest route out of direct sales, out of this business, is disappointment. And how many of you, I mean, I mean oh my gosh, you have a brand new CE and you're, you have that great interview, and then you're like, okay, this, this is gonna be good. She's got her party booked, and you know, but then nobody RSVPs to the party, or one person's coming to her launch, or the, the party cancels, or, you know, who knows that first disappointment, you know, you know, you've been through it yourself and you've been through it with your team and you're like, ah, oh, crap. Like, why did this have to happen only a weekend? Like, couldn't it have waited like six months where she was a little more like committed and invested, but she's going to have those roadblocks and, and she's going to have those disappointments for you as a leader. The most important thing that you can do is acknowledge it and, and, Use the times that you have experienced the same thing to guide your words with her. You know, you've probably been there. You know, at this point, mm -hmm. I don't feel like there's much that I haven't been disappointed by or, or, you know, that I haven't experienced. I'm sure there's more out there. 
Um, but I've had pretty much all of the, you know, the top 10 <laughs> disappointing bad things that could happen in your business experiences. Um, so you've got to acknowledge how that feels, how you get yourself out of that funk. Um, you know, you've got to take your own frustrations and, yeah. and uh, disappointments as training nuggets for yourself for how you're going to help somebody else through that same situation. Um, but, you know, always kind of re-steering the ship, acknowledging that she's disappointed, you know, not saying, oh, it's fine, it'll be fine. Oh, say, oh my gosh, that has happened to me. I totally know how you feel. That, that stinks. You know, Veronica taught me a good lesson a couple months ago. She's like, sometimes people just want you to say, that sucks. And like, that's all. And like, they don't want you to try to explain it away or fix it. They just want you to, to be there with them in that moment of disappointment for a second. So, so don't be afraid mm -hmm. to do that. You know, be there with her for a minute and be like, oh, that totally stinks. And then, you know, try to show her that it, it happens and remind her of that, of that goal. Again, that's why it's got to be something personal. It can't be about the smart start. It's got to be something for her and, and help her come up with a solution. Um, you want to keep asking yourself with brand new CEs, what does she need to know right now? And what does she need to be doing right now? You know, she doesn't need to be digging into the compensation, most new CEs, into like the compensation plan and moving up in ranks. Not, not in those first few, few weeks or even months. Um, you'll know the difference. When somebody comes in a little bit with, with a different level of experience, they want to sponsor, they want to build a team. Like Tracy Warren, she came in, I mean, I got out of her way. Like she knew what she wanted to do. That's a rare bird. That's, you know, I came into this business with zero direct sales experience. Well, I mean, a little tiny bit of failed direct sales experience. But for the most part, I didn't know anything. And I certainly was not interested in sponsoring. If somebody had talked to me about building a team in the first couple of weeks of being a compassionate entrepreneur or even months, I probably wouldn't have been very comfortable with that. So just get to know somebody and understand where they are and really what they need to know right now. Um, booking is obviously the most important place to start. If somebody doesn't have parties on their calendar, they don't have a business. So you've got to make sure that you start with that launch. You start with those first parties because if she doesn't have parties, she doesn't have a business. So that's really the most important activity to start with. Teaching her to book parties from parties. You know, if I, if I was a broken record, that would be what I would say over and over again, because they've got to get momentum in their calendar. They've got to get that foundation of an actual business. And we have a home party business. And so that foundation is parties, um, home parties, Facebook parties, whatever, but making sure that she's got that foundation, um, of, of hopefully a party a week. Like I said in, in, the, in the week five Zoom, you know, just like for us, if we're not doing our presentation once a week, if we're not, you know, sharing our story, practicing, being, you know, engaged with, with the core of our business, which is sharing about the artisans and, and doing our presentation, we get a little wonky. So a brand new CE, like she needs to be doing, she needs to get out there and do it. That's where she's going to learn the most. That's where she's going to have the most fun um, is, is just doing the parties. Um, if someone is saying to you, this is one that I'm sure you've heard a million times because I have too. Um, nobody is interested. Nobody has money. Nobody has time. I can't find anybody to do parties with. This is huge. If, she's, if somebody's saying that to you, I have to like check myself because, hold on, I'm going to read the chat for a second. Um, okay, cool, Denise, and I try to attend her launch party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you can attend a launch, that's great. I, I decided pretty early on not to set that as a precedent because I didn't think it was sustainable for me. Um, but when your team's really, really small, if you want to do that, you can. Um, I just, my party, I know my party schedule and I know that if I was promising to go to everybody's launch parties, I would only be going to launch parties. So, um, but that's awesome, Donna. And I know that it helps. Um, you know, there's just no two ways about it. Yeah. When your team is small, why not? If you're willing and you have the time. Um, okay. I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah. So if somebody is saying, uh, nobody is interested, nobody has time, nobody, you know, everybody's so busy, nobody wants to have a party for me. Okay. This is a huge one. People say this all the time. Now, like I said, I have to kind of check myself and be like, um, no, 
plenty of people want to have parties. Like I had somebody tell, I mean, it kills me. Like literally like somebody signs up and, and the day they join, they're like, well, I just don't think anybody's going to want to do parties. I'm like, oh, you know, face palm. Like really, you just joined a home party company. You really believe that nobody wants to do parties. And then I don't want to be like, you know, I have a full calendar for the next three months and I've had a full calendar for the last five years. Like people want to do parties, you know, so I have to like control my own, like, you know, annoyance by that. But so you certainly don't want to do that. But what you do want to offer to somebody is role playing. And because chances are they are blaming something else, some ex, you know, out, outside factor that is not actually true. The problem is most of the time it's them. And it's something that they're saying, that they're not saying, that they're saying in a really awkward way. Um, and so role playing is kind of a frog activity for a lot of people, um, but it is incredibly powerful. And if you do it, and the couple of times that I've done it with people that are really having a hard time and I just can't figure out what the deal is. When I role play with them, it's like, oh, okay, I understand now. And then you can be like, you know, well, when you said that to me, it actually made me feel this way. Or, you know, um, let me repeat back to you what you just said and you tell me what, what you think, you know, your potential hostesses are thinking. And you can pinpoint, you know, things that they're saying or doing or, you know, or, or even just help them express themselves in a different way to maybe fix the problem. Um, because when somebody says nobody's interested or has money or time, um, they're blaming outside factors. Chances are it's probably them. Um, yes. And definitely. Yeah. Donna sometimes said she suggests alternative parties and that kind of things. Yes. You absolutely want to open up her mind to the possibility of, different types of parties, catalog parties, fundraisers, you know, as a new CE, you're thinking home party and Facebook and you, you know, that's why I created that resource post so people could go on and just see that there are literally a hundred ways to party. Um, but role play is, is really powerful, especially when somebody's, when you're really struggling with somebody and like nothing is, seems to be breaking through. The hardest part of the business for any new CE is getting out of their circles. I hear this over and over and over again. So emphasizing that from the very, very beginning, even when you're talking about the launch and saying, you know, if you're gonna have a launch party, it would be awesome if you could get some people there that you don't know very well or encourage mm -hmm. your, your, your friends to bring a friend and start to explain to her and, and paint that picture of expansion and getting out of the circles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I say a lot to new CEs, you know, there, you just have to believe that there are hundreds and hundreds of people out there that want to do parties with you that you haven't met yet. And if you can believe that, then, then you will be successful, but you have to believe it because it's the women that don't believe it. And they are limited by, well, none of my friends want to have a party. So therefore nobody wants to have a party. Like that's where people get stuck and then they're out the door. So you, you got to kind of hedge that by from that very beginning, first talking about her launch conversation, making sure that she understands how important it is to have people there that are outside of her circle or to start to work towards having a party with somebody outside of her circle. Um, so you can kind of head off that, that, that struggle. Um, you wanna try to stay with people for the first three months, obviously. Um, you know, make sure that you're there um, that, you know, if they're stuck, you're, you're available. You know, mm -hmm. I try, I keep, um, my current system for new CEs is this little, um, index card Rolodex thing. It's just mm -hmm. like an index card on a spiral, spiral bound notebook. And so I write down, um, their name when they joined and then the four months of their smart start. And then, um, I keep track of their sales in those months. Um, I keep little notes at the bottom, like did they qualify, did they get the chicks, you know, the different um, smart start goals. And I try to put dates when I talk to them. And I try to talk to these people weekly. Anybody that's in their smart start, I'm gonna be checking in with at least once a week. Mondays is always a good day, but it's not always Monday. But I am weekly um, checking in with people that are in their smart start. Once they get out of the smart start, you know, some of them have started and have built a business and they're great. And some of them haven't done anything. And I 
cross their, put a big, you know, line through their name and that's it. I've moved on. Um, but I think that you stick with them for those, for that smart start period. And that's, you know, this is industry wide. We have every, every company has a, has a fast start, smart start, strong start. I mean, whatever you want to call it. And it's always over like a three month, 90 day, hundred day period mm -hmm. because industry wide, half the people you sponsor today are going to be gone, mm -hmm. you know, in three months. So if, if you, if you set that as your kind of timeline, it, it makes it nice to keep track of who's staying and who's going. Um, you always want to stay connected to their why and, and building up their belief, you know, but again, as those roadblocks come through, you want to be there to catch them and be there to help them through it. Um, people often overestimate the amount of work that it takes to start a business and they also underestimate themselves. And I put that up as a graphic for you guys a couple weeks ago. Um, but that's why it's so important for you to believe to then, you know, you have to believe in yourself and your ability and in the business and in the business model to pour that belief into other people. And so, you know, recognizing that people might think it was going to be easier than it is, or they might think that they don't have the skills that it takes to do the work. So hedging that off is always really important. Direct selling is a really emotional business. And you as a leader always have to have a massive reservoir of belief. Um, and I can speak to this from total experience. I mean, it's, there are days where I don't think I can pump somebody up <laughs> and it's like, okay. And that doesn't happen very often because I've learned to manage my reservoir of belief. And when I, when I'm feeling like I need something or need to be filled up, I know how to, how to get there again. Um, and I have the, the, the support framework in place, but you as a leader, as you grow, you have to always keep that in check. You have to remember that people are going to need you to pour belief into them. And, and it's not, you know, I hear people talk about like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to handhold and I don't want to, no, I'm not asking you to, to, to do that. But telling somebody that, that you recognize the struggles that they're having, that you've been there, that knowing that this is an emotional business and we're, we're working with most, with hundred percent women. I mean, it's going, there's going to be emotions involved and people are going to, you know, feel doubts. And, and that is, you know, like I said, disappointment is the fastest route out of this business. So you got to be prepared for that as a leader and helping people find belief again in themselves when they start to waver. Um, okay. The other thing that people, um, often have questions about as leaders is who do I actually work with? You know, um, oh, that's good. Oh, good. Denise. I'm glad. I'm glad that your, your reservoir is on the other side. It's not empty. Um, and, and it's, you know, this has been a, who do I work with is a, a really important question. Again, protecting your most valuable resource, which is your time. It doesn't matter if you have two people on your team or 200 or 2000, you have the same amount of time in the day. And so you have to know and be smart about the people that you work with. The two groups of people that you work with as a leader are the people who are producing and new people. So I work with the people in this notebook because they are my new people and I work closely with them every week and I work with you guys because you guys are leaders, you're showing up and you're producing. I, I work with the people who put numbers on the board, who show up, who do, you know, it doesn't mean you're a top seller or you're, a, you know, but you're consistent, you're committed, you, you've continued to produce and, and those, are, those are the people that I, that I work with. Um, you know, when somebody's struggling, directing them to another piece of training is not always the most important thing to do. Encouraging them to go have a party. You know, the more that people do parties and experience things, the more they're going to learn. You know, on-the-job training is so powerful. Um, you know, again, that's kind of why I also don't go to launch parties with people because I want them to just jump in. I kind of want to just throw them in the water and just you know, let them swim a little bit. They're going to be fine. Um, it's so important to get people to do parties because once they're doing parties, you know, they're actually in the business and doing the business and that's going to keep them wanting to come back for more. Um, you have to empower people, you know, we're empowering our artisans, but really when we're sponsoring people, we want to empower them by 
not, not enabling them. Like you want to make sure that they are finding the answers that they need, that you're directing them to the resources. You know, have you watched that video on the app? If they have a question about something, um, you're, you know, we've created so many resources within, you know, like the great love nation and love rising and the, you know, all the different leaders have created great resource spots, you know, the pinned posts on the different pages the answers are out there. Um, so you want to make sure that you're empowering your new people to find those answers. And again, I think back to my own start, my own experience, there was nobody helping me. I mean, and I'm not saying that in like a complaining way. I'm actually kind of thankful because I have always been completely independent in my business. I've never depended on anybody. I never had a director. I never had, you know, an upline that was, there was no pinned post anywhere for me. There was certainly no app, you know, I just sort of figured it out. And that's powerful. And that wasn't like a, like a, like a bad thing. In, 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 if, if anything, it was a good thing. And it's made me the leader that I am today. Um, you know, just like when you teach your kids how to play a board game, um, you know, it's a whole idea of my move and then your move. Like you take turns and you go back and forth. You want to kind of establish that with your, with your new CEs. It's not all about your move. You're not always just giving them things and sending them things. And do you, know, if they don't give you anything back, then, then hold up for a minute. Give them a chance to make a move. Um, you want to, you, you, again, you want to empower people to, to you know, initiate and to step up and to seek out the answer that they need to take action themselves and not always giving them um, you know, everything that they need because to, to carry them is really to cripple them. And if you're, if you're carrying your new CEs along, you're not really um, enabling them to have a, their own business. Um, you wanna establish some of those expectations early on. I kind of assume that people are gonna wanna hear from me once a week, but it, they might not want to. Um, you know, so, so once you sort of establish that six month or one year goal with your new CE, tell them you're gonna be there for them, you're gonna support and guide them, um, you're gonna give feedback if they need it, um, but you really need to let them discover their true potential. So when I say, I say that to people, you know, you're going to do great. I am here for you, you know, jump into the, the, to the app, get that launch party on your calendar, explore the smart start. And I can't wait to hear what you're most excited about. And that's another kind of gauge that you can use too. What are you most excited about and see what they say instead of, jumping in with, let me tell you more about this training or about hostess coaching or about this. What are you excited about? And let them tell you and let that guide the conversations that you're going to have. If you allow people to dump on you, then they will depend on you to solve their problems. So don't be a dumping ground. Don't be a, don't allow pity parties. Um, one of the best things that, that uh, Mary Ann, our, our former trainer ever did for me, I used to call her whenever I was having struggles and, you know, more on a leadership side, like, like as my team was getting kind of big and I was like having personnel type issues, I would call Mary Ann and like tell her about a situation. And then really my hope was that she would just make the phone call and call the person for me. But then she would talk through it with me and then she'd be like, okay, let me know how it goes. And I'm like, what do you mean? You're not going to call her? <laughs> She's like, no, you're going to call her. I'm like, <laughs> But that's the greatest thing she ever could have done for me is make me make that phone call and get over my nerves and get over myself and just, you know, be willing to make a mistake or say the wrong thing. I mean, it, Lord knows I've done it and it's helped me become and grow, you know, into, into the leader that, that I'm growing into. You need to give new people the same kind of space to grow and the opportunity to, to discover their strengths and the things that they like to do. and you know, to face their own fears and then to move on from the mistakes. And you're just there to kind of support them along the way. Um, another really important thing, this is the last bit. It's just, this is going over time too. Um, don't waste time trying to resurrect past performers. Um, if you are continually sponsoring, you will continually have new people to work with and you'll have fresh excitement in your team all the time. Um, Somebody who has been around for a long time is wonderful, and, but if they're not working the business anymore, don't feel like you have to ask them to do a training video or lead a meeting or speak at a meeting or put them on a, on a pedestal because honestly, it's not fair to the rest of your team um, when you're giving accolades and influence to somebody who doesn't have a healthy personal business. 
So, so think about that as a leader, and that might not be something you have to think about quite yet, but it will come up. Um, and it's hard. It's hard because you've established relationships with people and you love them, but you can love them outside of Trades of Hope and, or when you see them at retreat or, or whatever, but you don't, you're not going to necessarily work with them regularly because maybe they just want to chit chat, but that's not what your time, you know, your time as a leader and when you're coaching, you're not calling to chit chat. Um, and you just have to love them and appreciate them in different ways. Um, yeah, you're not going to let them lead a training. <laughs> um, you want to spend your most precious resource, your time, with new people and with people that are producing. Um, so I know there, there was a lot there again, um, a lot of things to think about, a lot of things that maybe were hard to hear for some people. And, um, but just know that everything that I'm, that I'm sharing about these topics, and, because it becomes really personal when you start talking about sponsorship and stuff and you know, feeling inadequate. And I, just, I can tell you that I have felt inadequate so many times. I feel like I have let so many people down. But at the same time, I cannot let that feeling of guilt or inadequacy stop me from, from moving forward. Um, and it doesn't mean that I don't care. I certainly care a lot. <laughs> I care so much that it's um, that, that it could potentially be paralyzing. But I've never let it paralyze my business. I've never let somebody else's, you know, choices about what they were going to do or not do paralyze my commitment to the artisans, my commitment to this business, my commitment to um, to myself, and knowing what I have control over and what I can do differently. Um, just by making a different choice. And so if I'm not satisfied with my performance or something that I'm doing, then I'm going to change. I cannot change somebody else's behavior or choices. Um, and that's, that's been true from day one. And it's true on day whatever I'm on, 2000. Um, you can't change what other people choose to do or not do. Um, so, you know, I've quoted this before, but you you believe in everyone, but you rely on no one. And really the only person that you can rely on at the end of the day is you. And, and you know, but you believe that everybody has the same opportunity because they do. Um, you, you offer those simple things at the beginning. You offer your support. And if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, you've got a continual flow of new people coming into your business to fill those gaps when, when the revolving door um, continues to revolve. So um, hopefully that was helpful and good info for this week, um, part two of week six. Um, next week, uh, we're going to, actually, I'm not exactly sure where we're going to go. We've got two more weeks left and I want to kind of take a minute to, to pause and start talking. I want to, I wanted to go into leadership styles and I've got a couple of other things I want to maybe explore, but um, maybe even a little bit more on leading, um, leading a team and that kind of thing. So thank you guys again for hopping on this morning. Um, it was, it was nice to have, have guests. I'm going to stop the recording, but you don't have to hang up. So I'm going to stop.